What if I told you the moon, yes, that moon, might hold enough clean energy to power Earth for thousands of years? Sounds insane, right? Before I show you how China just uncovered minerals that could flip the entire global energy game, hit that subscribe button because today we're diving into a quiet space race that's unfolding 384,000 kilometers away. For millennia, humanity gazed up at the moon and saw only one side. The same craters, the same Maria, the same half of a celestial body locked in internal embrace with Earth. Due to tidal locking, the moon's rotation matches its orbit, meaning the far side, what many mistakenly call the dark side, remains cloaked in mystery. But it's not the absence of sunlight that made it dark. It was the absence of knowledge. We had no maps, no samples, no data. Only speculation. On January 3rd, China's Chang-4 mission etched itself into history as the first spacecraft to soft land on the far side of the moon. It wasn't just an engineering feat, it was a leap into the unknown. The lander carried a robotic explorer, U-22 or Jade Rabbit, which descended into the vast von Karman crater, part of the ancient South Pole Aitken Basin, one of the oldest and deepest impact zones in the solar system. But getting there was only half the challenge. Since the moon's far side never faces Earth, direct communication was impossible. No Earth antenna could reach it, so China launched Kuei Kuo, a specially designed relay satellite, and positioned it in a halo orbit around the Earth-Moon L2 Lagrange point, a gravitational equilibrium over 65,000 kilometers beyond the moon. There, Kuei Kuo became a celestial bridge, bouncing signals between Earth and the hidden side of the moon in near real time. With that single innovation, China opened up a part of the cosmos that had been forever out of reach. The dark side was illuminated, not by sunlight, but by science. And when U-22 began to roll across the ancient lunar floor, what it found wasn't just rock. During the Apollo era, astronauts brought home a treasure trove, 382 kilograms of lunar material. These samples taught us much about the moon's surface, but not its depths. Apollo landings were limited to relatively smooth equatorial zones for safety. That meant they only ever scratched the outermost crust, missing the layers that lie beneath where the real secrets are kept. U-22 changed that. Navigating the cratered rugged terrain of the South Pole Aiken Basin, the rover's ground-penetrating radar pierced deep into the lunar regolith. Beneath the powdery gray surface, it detected fragments of rock unlike any previously collected, chunks of olivine and low-calcium peroxine, minerals forged under intense heat and pressure. These were mantle materials, not crustal. Their presence suggested a titanic collision had once blown a hole deep into the moon's crust, flinging a broad primordial rock from its interior. For the first time in history, humans had access, not just to the moon's face, but to its bones. Why does this matter? Because a planet's mantle is its memory. Unlike the battered surface, constantly reshaped by impacts, the mantle retains the chemical and thermal history of a world's formation. These ancient materials are snapshots of a time when the moon was still molten, when the solar system was still young, and the earth was just beginning to form life. By studying them, scientists aren't just learning about the moon, they're deciphering the recipe for planetary birth. And maybe, just maybe, understanding what life took hold here and nowhere else. When Chang-6 touched down in May 2024, it went one step further. It didn't just explore the far side of the moon, it brought part of it home. It collected two kilograms of lunar soil and rock from the Apollo Basin, another scar within the South Pole Atkin region. These were the first samples ever returned from the moon's far side, and they stunned scientists the moment they were dated. One volcanic rock was over 4.2 billion years old older than any lunar sample previously recovered. But other pieces told a much stranger story. Some were just 2.8 billion years old, a timeline that didn't fit our existing models. According to the dominant Big Splash theory, the moon formed in a fiery collision with Earth, then cooled rapidly, becoming geologically dead within a billion years. It should have been dormant, but these rocks suggested otherwise. Volcanic activity had persisted, quietly, sporadically, billions of years longer than expected. This discovery changed everything. If the moon, a small airless radiation bathed world with no magnetic field, could stay active for that long, what did that say about other worlds? What if Mars, now cold and cracked, still hides volcanic life beneath its crust? 
What if Europa, with its icy shell and subsurface ocean, has geological heat that never stopped? The Chang-6 samples don't just rewrite the moon's history, they recalibrate our expectations for the entire solar system. Geological death might not be a final sentence, it might just be a pause, and wherever there is heat, there might be the ingredients for life. In December 2020, China stunned the world with the return of its Chang-5 mission, the first lunar sample retrieval since 1976. Touching down in a region never visited by Apollo astronauts, the probe collected 1.73 kilograms of fine-grained lunar regolith from Oceanus Procellarum, or the Ocean of Storms. This vast basaltic plain was once the site of intense volcanic activity more than a billion years ago, and China had chosen it deliberately. Where the U.S. explored the older highlands of the moon, China aimed for something more recent, less understood, and potentially more revealing. What came back wasn't just dust. Hidden within the fine gray powder were tiny, almost invisible crystalline formations, so small that only electron microscopes could reveal their secrets. Scientists from the Beijing Research Institute of Uranium Geology eventually announced something extraordinary, a brand new mineral never before seen on Earth or Moon. It was microscopic, transparent, and hexagonal in structure, formed in slender columns. They named it Change Site Y, after the Japanese moon goddess Chang in the honor of its origin. With that single discovery, China joined an exclusive club becoming only the third nation, alongside the United States and the former Soviet Union, to identify a new mineral from the lunar surface. But the true value of Change Site Y wasn't just scientific, it carried something far more coveted, Helium-3. A rare isotope virtually absent on Earth, but possibly the key to the future of clean energy. To understand why Helium-3 is such a game changer, we need to understand fusion, the process that powers the sun. Unlike fission, which splits atoms and leaves behind radioactive waste, fusion fuses atomic nuclei, releasing vast amounts of energy with little to no hazardous byproduct. But most earthbound fusion experiments rely on isotopes like deuterium and tritarium, which while powerful, still produce neutron radiation and long-lived waste. Helium-3 changes everything. When fused with deuterium, helium-3 produces energy and only protons. No neutrons, no radioactivity, no meltdown risk. It's the closest thing humanity has to zero-waste nuclear power, and one gram of it contains roughly 10 times the energy of a ton of coal. But there's a problem. Helium-3 is almost non-existent on Earth. Our planet's magnetic field deflects most of the solar wind, the source of this precious isotope. Meanwhile, the moon, airless, magnetically exposed, and billions of years old, has spent eons quietly absorbing helium-3, embedding it into the upper layers of its regolith. Data from China's Chang-1 lunar orbiter, combined with follow-up missions, suggests that the moon may contain more than 660,000 metric tons of helium-3. To put that into perspective, just 200 tons, an amount that would fill only two standard semi-trailers, could power the entire United States for one full year. And unlike oil or coal, helium-3 doesn't pollute. It's the holy grail of clean energy, so valuable it could upend the entire global energy economy. But there's another twist. The distribution of helium-3 isn't uniform. Some of it lies on the moon's near side, accessible, but already disturbed by earlier missions. The rest, it's preserved on the far side, near the lunar south pole, regions untouched by human or robotic activity and often rich in both helium-3 and frozen water. These polar zones, shaded in eternal darkness, are more than just strategic. They're sacred ground for future colonization and energy extraction. What started as a Cold War space race has evolved into a quiet but intensely strategic competition. One not just about planting flags or scientific prestige, but about securing the most valuable energy resource humanity may ever access. Whoever extracts and refines helium-3 first doesn't just win the moon. They gain energy independence the kind that can unseat oil empires, rewrite energy trade routes, and collapse carbon-based economies. According to geospatial modeling, 370,000 tons of helium-3 lie within reach on the moon's near side, but the remaining 290,000 tons, potentially richer in purity, are preserved on the far side, near the very poles China has already begun exploring. The Chang-4 mission proved that robotic landings on the far side are possible. The Kuei-Kuo relay satellite at the Earth-Moon L2 point continues to enable communication with rovers like U-22. 
China has even announced plans to build a permanent lunar base at the South Pole designed to facilitate long-term mining, energy extraction, and research. But here's the catch. Helium-3 fusion isn't ready. Yet. The leading experimental reactors like ITER in France and SPARC in the US are still working to achieve viable, self-sustaining fusion using deuterium and tritarium. Even if these projects succeed in the late 2030s, scaling them to use helium-3 will be another level entirely. Helium-3 fusion requires even higher temperatures, possibly up to a billion degrees Kelvin, and far more stable plasma confinement than current technologies can offer. Still, the trajectory is clear. The moment fusion becomes commercially viable, possibly by the 2040s or 2050s, the race for helium-3 will erupt, and the nation that already has a presence on the moon, access to its regolith, and a plan to extract helium-3? That nation will control the future of global energy. Because in the energy economy of tomorrow, power won't be measured in barrels or megawatts, but in grams of helium-3. And China is already holding the shovel. For decades, the prevailing theory of the moon's birth was relatively straightforward. Around 4.5 billion years ago, a Mars-sized object, often called Thea, collided with the early Earth, sending a plume of molten debris into orbit. That debris coalesced, cooled, and formed our moon. It was a tidy explanation, elegant in its simplicity. The geochemistry of Apollo samples seemed to support it. The isotopic similarities between Earth and Moon rock suggested a shared origin. The Moon we thought was our cosmic twin. But then came Chang. China's lunar probes, especially Chang-4 and Chang-5, began to return something unexpected. Data and samples that didn't quite fit the narrative. The far side of the moon, long shielded from Earth-based telescopes and never touched by Apollo astronauts, holds secrets buried in its crust. When China retrieved samples from regions untouched for billions of years, scientists discovered that the moon's far side wasn't just visually different, it was chemically alien. Rocks retrieved from the von Karman crater in Oceanus Procellarum contain isotopic ratios that diverge significantly from those found on the near side. They suggest a more complex internal structure than previously believed. Elements like thorium and uranium appear in concentrations that vary dramatically across different regions. What's more, some of the minerals extracted, like the newly classified Change Site Y, imply unique formation conditions under intense heat and pressure not evenly distributed across the moon's mantle. This evidence is rewriting everything. Instead of a uniform body created in a single explosive moment, the moon may have formed through a series of cataclysmic stages. Some now propose a multi-impact origin. Others are exploring the possibility of asymmetric accretion, where Earth's gravity shaped a lopsided moon from uneven debris. In short, our lunar companion may not be a passive reflection of Earth's history, but a geologically active, independently complex world. While scientific theories evolve, geopolitical strategies are already taking shape. In here, China is executing a method unlike any other. Subtle, patient, and precise. In a time when most spacefaring nations are still debating lunar logistics, China has already built a chain of robotic missions, each one testing, mapping, and refining the path to permanence. With every Chang mission, another brick is laid in a larger vision. Not for tourism, not for spectacle, but for settlement. At the heart of this vision lies the International Lunar Research Station a permanent, jointly constructed scientific outpost planned for the Moon's South Pole. Unlike the Apollo-era landings focused on equatorial regions, the South Pole is a treasure trove of frozen volatiles. Deep craters there harbor perpetual shadow, trapping ancient water ice, and shielding resources critical to long-term human survival. The ILRS is no vanity project. It's backed by real cooperation, particularly between China and Russia, with contributions invited from several other nations. The goal? A fully automated, robotically maintained, human-compatible lunar base by the early 2030s. And while that unfolds, robotic rovers like U-22 continue traversing the far side's dusty plains, collecting terrain data, assessing radiation exposure, and testing solar power systems. Orbital satellites are expanding high-resolution maps, pinpointing potential landing sites and mineral-rich zones. In contrast, the United States Artemis program, while ambitious, has struggled with delays. Political turnover, shifting budget priorities, and the challenge of coordinating with dozens of global partners have slowed its momentum. The Artemis Accords are a powerful diplomatic framework, but paper agreements alone won't build habitats. 
What China is building isn't just infrastructure, it's advantage. The moon has always been there, silent, still, and watching. But now, we're watching it back. 50 years ago, the Apollo missions planted flags. They spent days, not decades. They collected rocks, but left the soil untouched. In total, humans explored less than 0.01% of the lunar surface. They didn't dig deep. They didn't stay long. Today, the rules are changing. The real prize isn't who gets there first, it's who stays, who builds, who extracts, who sustains. The new space race isn't measured in kilometers, it's measured in permanence. And China is leading that race. With every new mission, they're not just revealing more of the moon's secrets, they're reshaping what we thought possible. From rethinking lunar origin to pioneering space-based energy and laying blueprints for off-world habitats, China is no longer catching up to the legacy of Apollo. They're writing their own chapter, one that may define the next century. As lunar dust settles over robotic footprints and buried instruments hum silently in the darkness, a quiet truth emerges. The moon is no longer a destination. Do you think China could become the first to turn lunar resources into global leverage? Or is an even bigger, quieter space race already unfolding beneath the surface? Share your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching this video with us and catch you in the next one.